Okie dokie. Um, hello, everyone. Very, very excited for, for, this, for this video here because we have the one and only Steve Kaufman. <laughs> Everybody is one and only, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yep, that is fair. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. It's not raining. Weather's fairly good here in Vancouver. That's good. So I'm, it's good. We have a snowstorm in Calgary. Like right now. Yeah, I'm looking out the window, and um, okay. it's like it's uh, it's snowing a lot. Like we have, I probably have. As I'm looking on the deck, there is probably, I would say, a good, maybe, five no five centimeters of snow. Easy. Okay. Easy. Oh, wow. easy, easy. So. Okay. That'll blow. Uh, it's our second, and it's our second snowfall of the year. So literally, our first snowfall right. was last week, um, uh -huh. and our summer was not as real summer. Uh huh. So when you talk to people in Calgary, it's, it's, it's the biggest complaint because obviously Calgary is very, a very long winter. Right. And yeah, has a very, very long winter. And it was very, um, people are not happy that our summer was so rainy and kind of chilly, to be honest. And so right. it wasn't fun. What was it like in Vancouver this year? Uh, pretty good. Like I have very selective memory, so it seems fine to me. <laughs> uh, it seems, seems like we had a fairly dry relatively dry uh summer but i'm sure there were periods in that where we had rain but uh it's pretty good what is a typical yeah. vancouver winter typical vancouver winter is cool and wet uh, a lot of the time with occasionally either a five ten day period of sunny weather cooler and possibly a snow dump and the snow might stay for again 10 12 days or so but overwhelmingly, the sky is overcast, it's drizzling, it's two, three, four, five degrees uh, centigrade. However, uh, the mountains right behind us uh, will have three, four meters of snow. So 20 minutes away by car, you can be skiing. So I don't mind the winters, but uh, my wife doesn't like it, it's a bit dreary. Like I like to ski, I play old timers hockey. So I have lots of stuff happening. My wife doesn't play old timers hockey. Uh, <laughs> So we go down to Palm Springs for much of the winter. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's fun. See the sun. Yeah. No, no kidding. Because Vancouver, that's one difference between Calgary and Vancouver. Calgary, even in the winter, if you look outside and you don't look at the snow, you would think it's 25 degrees outside. Oh, yeah. No, I used to do a lot of business in Alberta, not so much in Calgary, but in Edmonton and up in the Peace River country. And, you know, we'd leave uh, cloudy Vancouver and we'd land in clear blue skies and just like white as far as the eye could yeah. see in, in Edmonton, right? So, yeah, no, I know that. I know that. Interesting. Well, everyone and, and Steve as well, uh, the plan for today is pretty straightforward. I thought it'd be good if we spent the first chunk um, talking about the non-language side of Steve. I mean, where did Steve grow up? What does Steve like? What does he do in his free time? And talk a lot about the non-language, some of the non-language related stuff. I mean, you okay. obviously are very, very well known in, in, the, in, in the whole language learning world, I suppose you could say, in the polyglot world with, right. you know, with all the, the background you have. And so it'd be nice to start with some non-language stuff. And then obviously, of course, when we have Steve Kaufman, we must get into language learning topics. <laughs> what else? Or when we have asthma. So tell us, like, where, where are you from? Are you from Canada? So, so I was born in Sweden. Okay. And my parents are from what was, they were born in what was at that time the Austro-Hungarian Empire and what wow. became Czechoslovakia in uh, 1918. And my family's Jewish. And uh, of course, uh, in the late 30s, people in Czechoslovakia, elsewhere, I mean, the writing was on the wall, uh, desperately trying to get out. And uh, my father was a paint chemist and he was able to get a job in Sweden uh, as you know, running the production manager for a varnish factory. And so he and my mother left in 1939. I was born in Sweden in 1945. And then my father, seeing the moves that uh, the Soviet Union was making, didn't want to be caught twice, so uh, he decided to get out of the old uh, continent and uh, move to Montreal. And so I arrived in Montreal in 1951. Uh, by the way, vis-a-vis -vis language, I have no recollection of transitioning from Swedish to English. Uh, we spoke English at home. My parents said, we're now in Canada, we're going to speak English. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> I had friends and we did whatever, we played football, we, we, we played tag, we fought, we played street hockey, and I have no recollection that at any time I would have spoken other than the same English that they were speaking. But of course I didn't because I arrived 
speaking Swedish. Right. Which is interesting, just how quickly kids can, because they're just interested in communicating. They just, they don't even worry about what, what they're saying, whether it's correct or not correct. They just communicate. Uh, and so I probably forgot Swedish, although I went to Sweden in, uh, at the age of 16, uh, where I had an uncle, so I spent the summer there, and then at various times sort of relearned my Swedish, particularly uh, when I started getting involved more with language learning, which we can get into later on. But I grew up in Montreal, and uh, we had French at school, and uh, I couldn't speak French, really. Uh, I could throw a few words together. Again, an interesting observation. The language instruction is heavily focused on grammar, yet most of the people who come out of the system after 10 years, they don't have grammar, really. They only have words. Hmm. Moi, parler, vous, vous, bleu. They can't really put proper sentences together. They just have words. So it's interesting that what... You, remain, you retain his words, not necessarily. Is that, like, a, um, is that, like, an, is that a, uh, like an immersion program or is that just class? No, no, no. Immersion didn't exist in those days. Okay. We lived in Montreal. Montreal was two solitudes, one million English speakers, two million French speakers. It's, you know, where I lived in, you know, however many miles in any direction was all English speakers. Hmm. Uh, so, you, you know, if you went to the other side of Montreal, you would come into contact with French speakers. I mean, it's quite different from the situation right now where... Montreal is very bilingual. Uh, if you wanted to work in, a, in one of the offices downtown, uh, you spoke English. Everything was in English. Uh, so it, it's quite understandable why there was a fairly strong reaction against this on the part of French-speaking Quebecers. At any rate, I then got interested in French because we had a professor at McGill who made it interesting. And that's always stuck with me. You know, you have to make the language interesting. You can't force people to learn out of some sense of obligation. You know, French is an official language, therefore you should learn French. That's not very effective. When I got interested, then I got very interested. And then if you want to learn French in Montreal, you can, because there are newspapers, there are plays, there's movie theaters, there's music, there's people. Uh, and so uh, then after two years at McGill, I decided to leave McGill. I actually hitchhiked on a, on a ship. I went down to the port of Montreal, and three days in a row, I asked to see the captain of these different ships, uh, asking if I could work my way across to Europe. You hitchhiked and, on, a sh on a ship? Yeah, I just went down wow. there. And, and I, day after day, for three days, I would go to these ships that were moored there in the port. And I'd say, here I am. I'd like to work my way across to Europe. Could I speak to the captain? <laughs> Which, when I think of it now, is amazing. <laughs> and uh, on the third day, this uh, guy, a German, rather small, almost, I would call it a tramp steamer. This is a ship that was quite small and he said yeah we lost a sailor who went AWOL in Quebec City and sure you can come and work so I was so excited <laughs> is this like a phone. like a what kind of ship are you talking like a sailor well, it's, or like no 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 this is a, I'm a picturing freighter like a pirate time like no 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 a freighter like these are big <laughs> I know, but it was I'm smaller kidding. than the average it was a I'm freighter <laughs> and uh yeah, and, and the work was consisted of pounding on, on iron the whole time and wow. scraping rust and painting. And uh, yeah, and, and we had terrible food and half the crew was German who got drunk every night and half the crew was Spanish who were the more hardworking of the two groups. Although the stereotype would be that the Germans are hardworking and the Spanish are, are not, but that's not true. The Spanish were quite hardworking. Anyway, so then I went to Europe. I hitchhiked around my uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers all over Europe, settled into Grenoble, Grenoble, and studied there for a year. Then I went to Paris for two years. I, I was fortunate enough. The first year I, I did, had a lot of odd jobs and uh, I got a scholarship from the French government. Again, I just went to the embassy in Ottawa and said, here I am. I've you know, studied one year. I'd like to stay another two. I gather there are some scholarships, Canada, France, and I got one. So, that, so then I was in Paris for two years. And then I wrote the uh, Canadian government uh, foreign service exam. And the fact, I think, that as an Anglophone, I wrote the exam in French uh, helped me because, I don't know if you're familiar, the foreign service exam is you're dealing with a lot of people and a small number get selected. So mm -hmm. obviously anything you do that makes you stand out from the crowd is going to improve your chances of being selected. So then I was selected and... Uh, I was in Ottawa for a year and then I got wind of the fact that the government was planning to train someone in Mandarin because Canada was getting ready to recognize the People's Republic of China. 
So I started taking some Chinese lessons from a guy at the Taiwanese embassy who was so a when, teacher. When was, how long ago was this? 1968. Okay. 1967, actually, 1967. And, but then I wasn't able to tell them the, uh, the director of the Trade Commission Service that, you know, if you're going to send someone to learn Chinese, I'm your man because I've actually started learning Chinese. So, like, I'm motivated. Why wouldn't you choose someone motivated, right? So then they chose me and they sent me and I had a choice at that time between going to Monterey because we couldn't go to China because it was a cultural revolution. Right. Mm -hmm. Couldn't go to Taiwan because that would have been politically unacceptable to mm -hmm. the mainlanders. So I had a choice between Hong Kong and the uh, U.S. Defense Language Institute uh, in Monterey, California. And uh, as much as I, you know, like the idea of being a beach bum in California, I thought if I'm going to learn this language, I better go to where there's lots of Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So even though they're not Mandarin speakers, it was a, a Chinese environment. No Mandarin speakers in right. Hong Kong. And which again, to me, it's always important to think, oh, you got to go to where the language is spoken. But you don't necessarily have to go to where the language is spoken. Mandarin was not spoken in Hong Kong. Other than the odd, you know, waiter in a Northern Chinese restaurant and my teachers, no one else spoke Mandarin. But you can create your own language world and just do a lot of listening and reading, which is what I did. And so then I worked there for a while, was in and out of China. Then I ended up in Japan uh, with the embassy. And then subsequent to that, uh, because I had been working in the forest product sector at the embassy as a trade commissioner, and I knew the trade and I spoke Japanese. Then a major BC based uh, lumber exporting company asked me to set up an office for them in Tokyo. So wow. then I left the government service and um, did that for them. Then I worked for another, another, basically the, the other large lumber exporting company asked me to do the same for them. So I went back out to Tokyo. So I ended up spending nine years in Tokyo, all told, hmm. uh, which was a lot. And- Did you Japanese before going to Tokyo? No. Oh no, okay. Oh no, not zero. None, no. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things I, um, I had a major disagreement with my boss in Hong Kong. We were supposed to go to Beijing. Uh, I considered him a complete jerk. And uh, Beijing was a, would have been a very isolated post, me and him kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, life with him was, was not very pleasant. So I said, I'm not going to Beijing with him. Right. However, I told my, the government, I said, if you send me to Japan, I'll learn Japanese on my own. You just because you paid for me to learn Mandarin. And at I'll the time Japanese. you spoke English, yeah. French, Mandarin, and period. Else? period. Okay. Well, I had uh, I had learned Spanish. Yeah, I, I had learned Spanish because when I was in France, I used to go hitchhiking around in Spain a lot. Okay. So if you're sitting there with a the truck driver for six hours, sure. you gotta talk to him, right? Sure. That's why he picked you up. So so I did a lot of talking you know in Spanish and uh, discovering Spain in the mid 60s, which was again amazing. But, uh, and Swedish, when I was in, uh, especially in Grenoble, there were quite a few Swedish students there, especially Swedish girls. And so I, uh, I sort of brushed up a bit on my Swedish when I was back there one summer as a 16 year old. And then I had further opportunity to use my Swedish. Right. So I could stumble along in Swedish. My Spanish was better. Okay. And, uh, but then I went to Japan and, uh, I went, I, there was a sort of, a one hour thing lesson group that I sat in on for a month, one hour a day, it was kind of useless, but I just went out and got all the material that I could find to read and listen to. And so I'd have stuff on in my car all the time and I would be reading. And again, it's, it's just this listening and reading. So, and of course, if you are in an environment where the language is spoken, as was the case in Japan, uh, I'm not shy about using however little of the language that I know. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm if I'm learning a language where I'm I don't have easy access to the speakers, then I'm not I'm not going to set up a bunch of discussions on Skype where I have trouble saying anything. However, if I am where the language is spoken, or if I if I run into an Iranian here, however weak my Persian is, <laughs> you know they're fair game, you know. So uh, <laughs> and so in Japan, I I certainly started using it wherever I could, but most of the activity was listening. Got it. So I was uh, then in Japan, uh, initially with the embassy and then uh, with these two large uh, forest products companies. Back to Vancouver and then in 1987 I set up my own company 
to take advantage again of my knowledge of the Japanese market and uh, sort of niche products that the big producers were unwilling to supply because it was too much bother for them. What kind of products? Well, so sizes, basically. You know, the issue is standard sizes for the big mills are easy to produce. It's large volume. They get their crews trained on it and they just pump it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are large segments of the Japanese market where they required specialty sizes, smaller mm -hmm. sizes. And so we figured out a way in, you know. And what kind of products that. were these that you were? Well, it's all in spruce pine fir, right? So we okay. were able to find uh, I was able to source spruce from Alberta, where the knots are smaller because it's mm. cold. So you were selling uh, trees. Pardon? Like you're selling like spruce trees? No, no, no. Lumber. Lumber. The vast majority of the wood that Got goes it. from Canada to Japan is lumber. Interesting. The, the sizes that the industry was happy making were standard sizes. Everybody produces a range of sizes. In the case of the coastal industry, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different sizes, but they were all sure. standard. And in the interior, so if you picture the industry on the coast is big trees, in the interior is small trees. Hmm. On the coast, you have not free lumber, like clear lumber, and then you have large sections because typically on the coast, if it isn't clear, the knots are larger because a bigger tree has bigger branches. And therefore, you get bigger knots. And therefore, you want to have bigger pieces that you're making. Because wherever you have a knot, the wood is weaker. All right? Whereas if you go to northern Alberta, where typically you're looking at fire origin forests, 100 years old, very slow grown, very small knots, you end up with, therefore, smaller knots. You can make smaller sizes, and the, the piece still won't break. Right. So we sourced uh, boards up there, which we then processed into, I mean, in millimeters, like 40 by 30, 30 by 30, 28 by 36. I mean, very, very small pieces, lots of short sections, sometimes notched, like a whole range of products. We were at one time the largest wood supplier to the largest housing company in the world, a company called Sekisui House, which sold 72,000 housing units a year. <laughs> So, so therefore, but it was all a matter of, of uh, and, and the Japanese are very demanding. So, you know, we would have, you know, we had to, like where we were, when we were running these products, we had to pull out, you know, say a hundred pieces every hour, measure knot size, measure, you know, uh, size accuracy, variation and all that stuff. And we had to send these reports into them. So with each shipment would come a, a report, quality control analysis of the product we're putting out. Like mm. nobody does that. You couldn't get the big companies to do that. It's just a nuisance. Probably their, their workforce would, would object. I don't know. But, but so therefore we had this niche and we uh, developed that market. And then uh, at some point, um, because world prices for lumber tend to fluctuate. And so whereas we had in fact at one point been selling wood into Europe, it now because of, uh, you know, housing starts in the U.S. just skyrocketed. They were much higher mm -hmm. then than they are now even though the population of the U.S. at that time was 220 million, it's now 330 million. They yeah. built 50% more homes then than, than they're building now. And so prices were much higher in the U.S. Therefore, we could no longer, wasn't that attractive to take wood off the North American continent right. from Canada. It became more attractive to get wood in Europe to ship to Japan. So our business evolved that way. And that's where I really got into learning a lot of Swedish buying audiobooks on Swedish history and stuff because I ended up dealing a lot with Swedish suppliers and even in terms of explaining, you know, what the Japanese market required and getting all of the work, you know, the, the, the guy in the mail to understand what, how these things have to be, you know, produced and why. It was easier to explain all that in Swedish. So again, the Swedish helped mm -hmm. and of course the Japanese. And uh, yeah, and so I still have that company and now most of our work is bringing wood from Romania, Austria, Sweden to the east coast of the U.S. Got it. And here we're talking about traditional North American sizes, mm -hmm. which is still the bulk of, of the wood, uh, of, of the wood that's consumed here. So that's been, so my main involvement, my main professional career has been in, in the wood industry. Interesting. I would, an I industry that I really it. like, yeah. I really didn't know. That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting fact yeah. about you. And you still yeah, currently yeah. run that. 
I don't do much there because okay. we have people who do that. I'm interested. I go in, and I'm a. I, I my whole association with the forest industry has been wonderful. The in, initial period is with the Japanese uh, market, where of course they have a, a, you know, a sense of wood and appreciation of wood, but, which is very much tied to their culture, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's a renewal industry, renewable industry. I got involved with a sawmill in northern Alberta, dealing with the people there, including a, a Métis community that were shareholders of the mill, just understanding how things are up there and, and just watching how they manage the forest, which is a lot more sophisticated than people think. Like we have to ensure a balance of, you know, the hardwood understory versus what we plant and, and you know, sight lines that reduce pressure on certain animals and wildlife. And it's very, very sophisticated and everything involves consultation with the local community and stuff. And so that whole thing, I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the smell of wood and the sawmill and, and all the different things that go into making the, so that the wood will stay straight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to dry the wood carefully. We actually end up, people may not realize this, obviously logs are not all straight, but okay. if you saw with the sweep in the log, so you produce a, wood, uh, a piece of wood that's kind of sweepy. Actually, that will then straighten out in the dry kiln. And because it has followed the grain, it is straighter than if you tried to saw the log straight. Got it. So those are interesting things. So anyway, really no, I enjoyed the whole lumber and wood industry. That's really, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting to me. Um, so you, have you always been interested in languages or is that something that came later that later and later on? Well, obviously I was interested in French. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that I could go and learn Chinese was, wow, you know, that's just like a whole new world, right? And, uh, and I think the thing is that, that, to me, it was a bit of a, it, it was sort of an awakening and a sense of achievement when I realized that I had become fluent in French. So right. it's not like that I could, it's not like some of our English speaking politicians who can struggle a lot in Canada, right? Who struggle along in French. Like I was fluent in French. I could, I mean, I did all my studies in France, right? I had to write my exams. I had to, we had oral exams. I had to answer these questions on the fly. Like I was functional in French. Once you've done that, and I always say this, you know, once you've converted yourself, transformed yourself into someone who is like genuinely fluent in another language, that's a major, you know, breakthrough. So mm -hmm. then I had no doubt that I could do the same for Chinese. There, there was never, like a friend of mine asked, yeah, Steve, but if you go out to Hong Kong and, on assignment, and what if you can't learn Chinese? I, I couldn't understand the question. Like, right. I can learn Chinese. I learned French, I learned Chinese. Right. And, and with every, and I'm sure you've had this experience, with every language you learn, you become more and more confident. Uh, the process of, of discovering a new language just is, is more and more old hat. You've done it before. It mm -hmm. starts out total confusion and slowly it becomes comprehensible and little by little you can yeah. actually, you know what I did, by the way, we have Gujarati at link. Okay. You speak Gujarati, right? I do. Yeah. So I said, well, before I get on with Azrin, I'm just going to check out Gujarati. I never looked at it. So I'm listening to the mini stories. Of course, I've done the mini stories now in about five or six languages, right? In Greek and Romanian and Persian and Mm -hmm. Arabic and Turkish and so forth. So I know the stories. So I listen to the first story. Like I know what they're saying. Not because I understand what they're saying, but, but I know the, the story. Stories of languages, you know the languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, and so I have the same feeling that I had when I started in Arabic or Turkish or, or, or Persian. Like it's just noise. But I have no doubt that within a couple of months, it's no longer noise. Right. Now, I looked at the writing system, Gujarati, that was a little int intimidating. But again, everything is intimidating at first. Like Arabic is intimidating as well. Are you at least Hindi or no? No. No, no, no. and we should get Hindi, at, at, but we just have, it's, it's a function of demand plus availability of resources. So somebody, I don't know who, managed to get Gujarati done, uh, you know, the mini stories. So we get it, we put it up. Uh, and I, I also got, the, the, everything ends in che. So mm -hmm. the only thing I got out of the Gujarati <laughs> was, in a number of languages, there is a question word, like hal, uh, uh, or, or, or in Arabic, whatever. in shu is the question word in Gujarati. Mm -hmm. Shu, blah, blah, blah. Shu, are you, blah, blah, blah. whatever, it begins with shu and ends in che. That's all I got. I listened to it for 15 minutes. That's all I got out of it. 
but uh, I have no doubt that if I were to apply myself, but I'm not. I think if I were going to spend the time to learn a uh, South Asian language, which I want to do, I would go either Urdu or Hindi. Right. Now, I don't know how different Gujarati is from Urdu and Hindi. But... So I can, so it, it's, uh, it's different, but not crazy different. So it's kind of like, um, a sim I could probably compare it to like, so let's start here. Phonetically, like the sounds of Gujarati and Hindi are right. basically identical. Okay. Like literally the alpha. Like, so if you can read Hindi, you can probably yeah. read Gujarati and vice versa. At least mostly. And I noticed that Gujarati goes from left to right. Is that the same with uh, Hindi? You got it. It goes left to right. The biggest difference in Hindi and Gujarati is Hindi is a line on top. Right. The letters. Gujarati has no line. That is the biggest difference. A couple letters look a little different, but literally if you line the alphabet up. Right. It's almost, it's basic, it basically the identical alphabet. Okay. Um, grammatically, a couple differences. So for example, Gujarati has three genders, Hindi has two. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason to study Hindi right there. <laughs> so there's, there are some differences, but they're okay. remarkably, remarkably similar. Okay. So, um, so when did you start actually working in languages? You've been learning, obviously, learning languages for a long time. Yeah. So after for a while, I, I found obviously anything that you have some success at, you want to do more of, right? Right. So, uh, uh, backing up. So when you were younger, it wasn't really a passion for languages then. It was no, that interesting. No, it was very specific. It was specific yeah. to French. Yes. Or when I was in Spain, of course, I had Spanish. to speak Spanish. Yes. Uh, but the, the first time I sort of specifically decided to go after a language. No, I should say when I was on my German ship there, I had my German book and I was trying to ace the okay. German declension. So when did it go for Well, I'll, I'll get to that. But, yeah. but trying to ace the declension table is a futile task. You're not going to do it Yeah. Uh, without having enough exposure <laughs> to the language. So, but then when I was between jobs, I spent a month. I said, I'm going to really go after German. That was the first time I said, let's really go after German. So I scoured the secondhand bookstores in Vancouver and found a bunch of readers with glossaries. In those days, there was no online dictionary, no online anything, 1987. So I scoured the bookstores for readers with glossaries. And I just did a lot of listening and reading, or reading rather. And then I found this tremendous German uh, cassette tape series where there were a lot of casual interviews. So I listened to a lot of that. So I spent a month. And it was amazing how much I, I was able to achieve in that one month. And that was that. And then, of course, I did business in Germany and then in Sweden and stuff. But the major emphasis on sort of deliberately learning a language, it, it's funny. You never know what leads to what, right? That's mm -hmm. why I always say, you just do something. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily know what it's going to lead to, but just do <clears> something. <throat> so I started, I, I started learning Cantonese. And my wife is Cantonese speaker, but she wouldn't help me. Okay. Because, and I think this is good advice for anybody. Don't expect your spouse to be your teacher. Uh, unless you have been speaking that language all along, you mm -hmm. can't get family members who may speak another language. That's been my experience. It's very difficult to, to create this artificial, well, now we're going to speak this other language. It, it goes for like a minute. And then you go mm -hmm. back to the language you're used to speaking to each other, which in our case is English, because she's equally fluent in English. But I got people to translate, at least to record stuff that I could read in Mandarin, recorded in Cantonese, so I worked very hard. And part of it was discovering the mini disc player. Mm -hmm. Now, People have forgotten the mini disc player, but the mini disc player was a major improvement over the cassette player. Because yep. the cassette and the cassette player was a major improvement on the open reel yep. tape recorder. Uh, so with the mini disc player, and then very quickly it went to MP3 players. This idea that you have this tremendously mobile sound in small, you know, containers that you can carry with you and you can always listen to. And I found that very appealing. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go after Cantonese. And part of it too was I got a book where someone said Cantonese is not that difficult. There's not nine tones. There's only six. It's good enough. Don't worry about it. So anything that you do that reduces the inhibition, fear, intimidation, frustration helps people learn languages. So I, I had been re resisting going after Cantonese because the Cantonese, like so many people, you know, Poles, Japanese, Koreans, they all like to make out like their own language is the most difficult language. Like no one can learn my language. Like our language yeah. is so difficult. I've got, a, I've got a friend who says that about Arabic. He says, I can't wait till you start to learn Arabic. I say, why is he? Because I'm telling you it's the hardest thing. You're gonna find it really hard. And I said, I probably will find it difficult and there will be challenges. Of course, there absolutely will be. Like I, you're not wrong, but no, it's gonna be 
of average, diff it's going to be something like, oh, that's different. Hmm. How does that work? Oh, I got to say that. Oh, oh, but I'll be with time and I'll chip away. And he's like, no, no, I'm telling you as and I can't wait till he start. And I was like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll see. No, no. Arabic is difficult. The writing system makes it difficult. Like Farsi is a lot easier than Arabic. Okay. okay. Cause it's an Indo-European language. The structures are more familiar. Mm -hmm. But it's not insurmountable. I mean, every language has its difficulty. Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Slavic languages with their complicated grammar. I mean, there's difficulties with every language. But so this guy convinced me that I should go after Cantonese, as a result of which I was listening to Cantonese radio. I became aware of a Chinese immigrant to Vancouver who had all his life savings in a bag at the airport. And it was stolen. And apparently there are gangs that prey on these Chinese immigrants oh, no. because they all carry their savings in a little bag, like which is not very smart. And of course, there are people in their community know that. And so he had his money stolen. And I heard about that while listening to Cantonese radio. So because we were building software at that time for sawmills, uh, I said, okay, this guy's an IT guy. We'll give him a job. If he's good, he stays. If he's not good, we help him out. Basically, that was the motivation. The guy's English theory, you know, he had a high score. And you know what TOEFL is? Yep. Test? Yeah. So he had a high score on TOEFL, but he couldn't communicate like period, he had no concept, like, because it's not just TOEFL, as you know, to communicate, you actually have to understand where people are coming from. Sure. You have to understand some, some of the culture. You have to want to be in that cultural environment. You can't just sit back there with your TOEFL score. So this guy was hopeless, shouldn't say hopeless, but he wasn't very good. So we developed this system for him. We say, here's what, here's how Canadians think. Here's some stuff, audio with text, business people, we actually had a deal with the Rotary where, you know, 10 or 12 different people in the Rotary described their businesses and what they do, and we transcribed it. And so we started building this library of stuff. We eventually wanted to interest the immigration department on it because not all immigrants come here are illiterate. A lot of immigrants who come here have poor English, but actually are quite, you know, literate in their own mm -hmm. language. And therefore they could use a system like yep. Link. And uh, he eventually ended up going back to China we tried to interest the immigration department, not very successful because the business model of the immigration services organizations is how do I get more funding from the government? And therefore a system that shortcuts the need for going to the classroom right, that or reduces it. the need for going that's to the classroom looking for. cuts yeah. into their business model. Yeah. So that was a no go. And so then we said, and this would be in 2006 or seven, we said, okay, we'll make this a multi-language platform where people will help each other because they'll create content for each other and they can tutor each other. And, and that was the beginning of Link. I see. And so, Interesting. And, and it was very slow and clunky. And I can remember when, and I, the How first language. How long did Link start? As I say, I'm, I'm going from memory, but I would think 2007, 2008. 2007, 2008. And for people and who I, don't know, what, what is Link for people who have mentioned a couple of uh, times? Okay. Link is a website which we think you know, it creates an environment where you can take advantage of the internet to learn languages. Because via the internet, you can find all kinds of resources, always audio and text. Mm -hmm. uh, you can download stuff to your MP3 player, to your iPhone today, it wasn't the case then. You can use online, dic online dictionaries. Uh, we develop a bunch of functionality where you you know, the words that you look up become flashcards. Because you're doing it electronically, you, we can track electronic or even offline if you are listening to stuff. We can track how many words you know, how many words you've learned, how many hours you've listened, how many words you've read. And that's very important because language learning is all about being active. And so this, even if you sometimes think you aren't learning, if you have been active, you're improving. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that shows you on your lesson page as you're learning that in fact, more and more of this, now you understand is comprehensible. And language learning is about making things comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just convenient, like it's, it's a system. I'm sure there are other systems that people get used to and they like, but there are those who find that link is uh, convenient, has really everything you need, but there may not be anything there that taken on its own is unique, like not available elsewhere, mm -hmm. but it's just a collection of things that makes it a convenient place to learn. And so my first language that I did at Link was Russian. 
Okay. And at that time, every single word you looked up was taking three, four seconds. Like it was so clunky. And I can remember actually, I was, I was training at Silver Star because we have Swedish suppliers and in Sweden, there's a 90 kilometer cross country ski race that mm -hmm. I wanted to go in. So I, you got to train for that. You can't just go over there. Of course. And so I was training and I was listening to Russian novels and then I'd go back and I'd be looking up each word and saving phrases and then I'd be listening to it. And it was so clunky, so clunky. Whereas now it's, it's very fast. Like it's, I have never learned languages as fast as I do now. Mm -hmm. Simply because the system is just so much more powerful than, than it was back then. Yep. And, uh, and I'm more confident. And uh, I, I said this in a recent video, I think too, that your brain, I'm sh I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. You know, the more languages you learn, the more fit for language learning your brain becomes. The more flexible, <laughs> and it just becomes easier and easier. And if you're going to play a sport, you have to be fit. And mm -hmm. you may be a tennis player, but it's a good thing to play basketball or it's a good thing to do other things, to lift weights or whatever you have to have. So if you're learning language A, it's a good thing also then to learn language B and C and then go back to language A. Mm -hmm. So I'm finding that I am at the age of 74 today, by the way, today's my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Our birthdays so, are very similar. My birthday oh, is all days. Yeah. Oh, very good. So uh, yeah, I'm a better language learner today than I was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to the fact that I've learned so many languages, I'm more confident, but also my brain is more fit for language learning. may not be fit for doing, you know, math, but it's fit <laughs> for doing languages. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with you hundred percent. I mean, it's, um, so I, my, my world as of right now is, is teaching languages. So right. basically I run what's called the Calgary language nerds. So there's right. myself and a few other teachers. We, um, we teach English, primarily English, French, Spanish, uh -huh. Too a, little bit to, a little bit to children, um, primarily to adults, some private classes, some group classes, a little mm -hmm. bit of everything. Um, and are these, uh, are these refugees like the recent immigrants or? Um, nope. A lot of them are people that are just interested in learning. English is people right. who are learning because they've, they've moved to Canada, they're in Calgary, they need to learn English, right. Work, right. Right, et cetera. But the people primarily for people that are for French, Spanish, there's some right. kind of personal interest. Could be work right. right, could be you want to retire in Mexico, could be whatever. Right. Yeah. Could be people that just literally just like learning languages as different right. types of people. There are prior such people. to that <clears throat> prior to that, I used to run a window cleaning business. Yeah. Um, and so I was for five and about five and a half years. And so and in that role, there's a lot of teaching and coaching and, and feedback and stuff that I do, which ties a lot to what I do now. Right. But something I've noticed, right? When someone is first introduced to a skill, let alone languages, let alone sales training, let alone, well, any kind of training, when they're learning something that it's a brand new skill set, it's kind of like the brain is very rigid. It's kind of like right. you're talking about the flexibility. The brain's very rigid. So it's like when you first introduce, oh yeah, in Spanish, you know, you can't say yo hablar, yo hablar, or it's yo hablo. Right. Why? Like the fact, even that concept for many, if they never see like so, their brain's like, what? why and then and then but after a while they their brain gets more used to it when you introduce something that's not conjugation related it's, some, it's a different grammar point their brain goes oh okay you're almost used to seeing something different your brain gets used to seeing something different and you're like oh i don't really get that but I, I could your brain can figure it out it's more flexible i think as you said right. in words well that's a very interesting point because i remember when i started learning chinese and of course in chinese to say are you going they it means yeah. you, you of you, course you. yeah of course. You go, not go. So I had another fellow, he was with the Canadian Immigration Department, he was learning Chinese with me. And he said, is that ever stupid? Like, why would they do it that way? So hmm. there is this level at which we resist, we resist a different way of expressing things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some languages, there are no articles. In sure. some languages, there is no plural. Uh, some languages have some complicated way of doing things. And when you, and so they, these are elements of ambiguity to some extent, they're strange. And the good language learners have no resistance to strangeness. Yep. Strange, unclear, fuzzy, it'll get clearer in time. <coughs> Whereas people who don't have that experience, they get quite uptight. The minute there's something that's different from what they're used to, the way it should be. Like it shouldn't be that way, it should be this way. Yep. So. Well, I think I, I relate it to myself and other skills. Like in languages, I'm incredibly, flexible. Like I feel very comfortable right. making mistakes. I feel very comfortable with sounding dumb, quote unquote, right. I'm comfortable with 
being in a situation and literally not understanding what people are saying, I get frustrated. I think, man, right. I can understand, but it's, yeah. but I'm okay. It's fine. Right. Um, Part of the process. Yeah. But in other, in other elements, like for example, um, for instance, if I, like, if I took a dance class today, any kind right. of dance, um, I would be incredibly rigid, incredibly not flexible. I would take people would be like, Asin, it's okay. Just make mistakes. I'm like, no, that feels wrong. That doesn't feel natural. I don't, I have to move my arm like this. Like what? Wh wh why? Like that's right. my arm doesn't do. When do I ever do this? Or when do I, but in languages, I'll be like, Oh, I have to go. Rrr. Oh, I've never done rrr before. Oh, I've never done like, an, I've never done that sound or, Oh, I've never, Tried, I've never said any chibu, like chibu chibu and I've never, never said that right. before. It's so strange for me. Oh, what? But it's okay. So right. I, I can relate to people. I could really understand why people do struggle with it because I can feel it in other parts of my life, right? So I really relate. But I think what you're saying is true. You, until you get over that, you're, you're, you're almost stuck in a way. Or it really right. slows you down. For sure. I agree with you. Yeah, and I think one of the advantages in those countries where they have, uh, you know, television programs in the original language, like not dubbed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it helps people to learn English. And I was impressed. I was recently in Croatia uh, at the level of English there. Mm -hmm. And there they have television programs in the original language and they listen to songs and stuff. It's not just that they're learning English. Mm -hmm. Kids are getting used to the idea that a lot of things can be unclear. So they're watching right. cartoons in English. And there's a lot of language flying by them that they don't understand, but it's okay. That's normal. It's normal that I don't understand. And mm -hmm. in time, I understand better. And, and that, so they get used to the idea of, of ambiguity, of uh, uncertainty and stuff. Yep. And, and I think that's what we should do in schools. We should give the kids three languages and let them get used to the idea that, that it's quite comfortable to be in a situation where you don't quite understand everything. And, and that's why I, I object in typical or traditional language instruction where they're always asking people, tell me what happened in the story. And mm -hmm. I don't remember, but I still listen to the story, but I don't remember. And I don't want to have to remember. Mm -hmm. I, I was still exposed to the language. And mm -hmm. I think we should allow more ambiguity or, or, and even errors in mm -hmm. language instruction at an early stage in schools. And later on, if the learner has been exposed to a lot of that language, they'll eventually start to focus in on improving their accuracy. But insisting on total comprehension, total accuracy early on is, is uh, I think, uh, unnecessary and uh, basically counterproductive. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think it's um, it's interesting to me to see so me, I, I spend my whole lot, my whole, everything I do is watching learners and of all ages, all experiences, different backgrounds. Right. And it's very funny to see, I almost find there's like a spectrum. There's people that are completely on the left, completely on the right. What I mean by that is there's people who are extremely, let's call it rigid, very like, why right. should I say it like this? Can I right. say this? Was this correct? Did I pronounce that right? That are completely every right. hill, every T. And there's people that are like literally the other extreme and they're going, it's just completely, it's just not even, it's whatever comes out of their mouth. And they're, it's right. just, what are you, what are you saying? What, what is happening? Almost like they're a loose cannon. And right. um, it's, it's interesting when I've seen people like that progress, you know, that have those very different types of, let's take those two extremes. It's been interesting to see the end result. So I've seen people who let's say were very rigid and really cared about crossing the T's, dotting the I's. I see them in the future. They are very, Often, if assuming they continue to study and they stuck with it and they kept working, I see them as technically very strong, even when they're more intermediate, they're technically very strong. They speak correctly, their pronunciation's good, they can express themselves. If you say something to them, they will generally understand if it's something they've seen, but it's a very almost like slow, quote unquote. It takes them, might take them time to think about what you said, might take them time to respond. Versus right. the other spectrum, <clears throat> when they speak, there's mistakes left, right, and center when they speak and they're more intermediate. You understood what they said. They'll understand the gist of what you said. That you might ask them, "Where do you live?" and they understood, "Where did you live when you were a kid?" or who knows. You might ask, right. "Where did you live when you were a kid?" and they're like, "Oh, I live in Calgary right now." They understood right. talking about living, but not fully. So I almost find that there's different when I've seen them both develop. There's almost different right. errors but and gaps they have. However, a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, you know, you say, "Well, you know, what was the question? Where do you live?" or something like sure. that. Where? Yeah. Most situations, if you're in a foreign language, you have to have experienced it before. 
Mm -hmm. So I agree. You can you can learn what to say when you're buying train tickets at the train station. You know, have it all warmed up and ready to yeah. go, and then you ask the person, and doesn't have this experience, and they <laughs> comes back at you. You don't know what they said, of course. But the second time you will. Yep. So you have to have experienced it, even if you're very good at the language. All the different situations that happen, at some point you have to take what you've learned and and put it into practice and, and gain some experience in that particular situation. So you can almost anticipate what people are going to say because you almost of need course. to anticipate what they're going to say before you can react to it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is that a lot of people who are hung up about producing the language properly, like I, my approach, if I look at my statistics, uh, with, and I use my mini stories a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've listened to my Arabic, Turkish, Persian mini stories 30, 40, 50 times. That's not because I sit there and listen to the one story because you can't. You can't stay on one thing. You got to keep moving it along and then go back. So I go story one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, so one gets hit more often because I'm always going back to one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll start going back to 10, from 10 to 20. Sure. But I'm adding you know, like 30, 40 times per story. I've listened and read them eight, 10 times. Not many people do that. So, you know, our people now, you might say, well, that's boring. To me, it's fun because I, I have this sense that slowly the language is seeping into my brain, but it does take a lot of work on comprehension. I find if you don't have a solid base in comprehension, you may be able to produce some of the language, but you'll be a, somewhat defenseless when the language comes back at you. Mm -hmm. And so, and even with a lot of comprehension, you still need to have that prior experience so that you can actually anticipate what people are going to say because kind of like, most of ours yeah go ahead sorry i was going to say it's kind of like um uh, one of the things i was thinking about recently um people want some, something people ask me a lot is do you believe more in output based mm -hmm. approaches or input based mm -hmm. i've always been kind of don't really have a strong opinion either way but i will say this um i believe both are important however I, I will say that for me personally, from what I've seen, from based on my experiences, in many ways, the input does drive the output in certain ways. So for example, Absolutely. for me anyway, so I will say, like for me, there's things that I know how to say, um, and I say them very naturally in different language. And the reason I know is because I've, I've hung out with a specific person or I've, I've watched videos of someone that I liked on YouTube or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, that language, and they said it. And I was like, oh, I like how they say that. I'm going to say it like them. Right. Input drove me being able to say it. So that's you, my experience. Yeah, yeah, you can also say that the output drives the input. In other words, the output, that means you're speaking to someone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Therefore, that someone is speaking back to you. Sure, yep, very true. So the big part of output is that it drives, excuse me, of output, yeah, it drives more meaningful input. Mm -hmm. Input that has resonance because you're engaged with someone and so you want to know what they're saying. And as you say, you try to pick up on how they're using the language. So basically, it's the input that you're learning from. Uh, and the output, yeah, you got output at the time. And of course, you're in conversation, you're going to be looking to output, but you'll only ever be able to mobilize a small portion of what you have of your sort of passive vocabulary but you need that larger passive vocabulary because especially if you're talking to native speakers they're all going to have always going to have a much bigger vocabulary than of course you. so of course. so you've got to be able to follow everything they say even though you use a smaller subset of that but you've got to have the ability to understand what they're saying so i'm a big believer with crash and in input and output when the opportunity arises if, if i'm living in japan i'm going to output but if I'm learning on my own, like, uh, you know, I, Farsi, Arabic, whatever, once a week is good enough. And the rest yeah. of the time I'm working on getting my yeah. comprehension. But if I go to the, the, to the bay here and the half the sales clerks are Iranians, I'm going to use my Farsi yeah. as much as I can. I think that's the important thing. Like, I think, and this is, again, for me personally, if I were to go 100, 0, 100% 100 input, 0 output, I think it wouldn't work for me personally. Right. I think there has to be a certain, there has to be some balance between the two. They can't be 100, mm -hmm. 0, I think. Yeah, it's a matter of taste, whatever you yeah. feel like doing. For me personally, yeah. Um, yeah. but I, I do, like what, what I can relate to what you're saying with the, um, your mini stories and reading it or listening to it 30, 40, X number of times, 
you know, I'm similar with, uh, in two ways. Number one is songs. I really like, I just like music as a whole. Right. So I listen to songs a lot and it's very interesting. I'll listen to the same song a hundred times over six months or whatever it right. is. Yeah. And it is funny because I will notice like, Hey, Oh, I didn't realize. Holy cow. He's saying that word. Huh? I didn't notice that. Wow. Cool. Or, but, but, and also one thing is when you're listening to stuff over and over again, like your songs, yeah. you notice different things each time. Yes. There's some things, there's a lot of stuff we don't notice. It just flies by us. Mm -hmm. And then you listen to the song for the 20th time and you'll notice that there's a structure there. Okay. It was always there, but you never really focused on it. But now you, this time you focus on it. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the value of listening, uh, you know, many, many times to the same content, as long as it doesn't yeah. get boring. And I do think it's, it's what I, as a measuring stick, I found, I'd, you know, is if you revisit something that was hard for you, six months right. ago, one year ago, yeah. two, however yeah, yeah. long ago, and you revisit it. I've done it by accident until I realized it's like, oh, this is actually a good measuring stick. And I will right. now do it on purpose because I've right. noticed it. It's a very good way to see if you, how much you progress. Cause it's like, wow, Absolutely. I remember there's this game show I watched in uh, Mandarin. Uh, like it would have been when I first saw it, it would have been, I don't know, two, three years ago. Right. Random game show or um, game show episode talk. Sorry, not game show talk show. Sorry, talk show episode. And I watched maybe half of it and it was, I understood maybe 10% and it was really cool. I came across it maybe, maybe six months ago, th th maybe three to six months ago. It was just a suggested video on YouTube. It's like, Oh, that video. I remember watching that watching. I was like, wow, I'm understanding like all of it. Maybe there's yeah, yeah. a couple words, a couple of things I missed, but like, I'm like, I'm a hundred. It was very cool. It was very, very cool. So it's a very good measuring stick. I find it's in a good measuring stick and it's very encouraging. Very encouraging. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something that we should do from time to time because so often you have the feeling you're not getting anywhere. Of course. And so you go back and you check and you say, yeah, I'm getting somewhere. And the other interesting thing is sometimes if you leave a language, you haven't been working on it, but you've been working on other languages and you go back to that first language after a gap of three months or so, some things you hear more clearly, you actually hear it better. Hmm. It's what I call the benign neglect theory of language learning. Benign, anyway. sorry, neglect? Be benign neglect. Leave it for a while. When you get back to it, it'll be just, have gestated in your brain. That's actually very true. I, I call it digesting. I think it's like when you eat a meal, you eat something yeah. and your body needs time to digest that. Absolutely. Food. And then yeah. you come back, you're like, and then you can't keep eating. You're, you're get full and you throw up and it doesn't work. So you have to let right. digest. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, any parting, we've been going for a little, little under an hour, but um, any parting thoughts, any I think what people should take away from our discussion, uh, which they might sense both in what you're saying and what I'm saying is if you're going to be, if you are to be a successful language learner, you have to enjoy it. You have to find a way to enjoy it, whether that be songs for some people, whether it be history in my case, which I enjoy, you have to find a method of learning input, output, whatever. It doesn't matter. Find something that you find enjoyable. If it's enjoyable, you'll stay with it. And emotionally, it'll be positive there's positive juices running around in your brain and you will succeed so i think enjoyment is kind of the secret this magic potion yeah and it's the hard and it's the hardest it's hard for some people because i you know i try and put it in my shoes i'm not a big fan of math for example right if i had to learn math like I'm, it's it's i think you're right like it has to be enjoyable and it's challenge then becomes for someone who it's not if someone's watching this video or listening to this podcast i mean Odds are they like languages. They're not listening to right. them, most likely. Yeah. That's yeah. just my audience. It's, you know, they're not, they're not going to be one hour through the podcast <laughs> and not like language learning. But the right. challenge becomes for average Joe who works in, let's say, the lumber industry, who works in, right. oh, well, they've been told by their work, hey, you're going to blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, I learned Japanese. My aunt is, uh, my aunt's in a similar position. She was telling me about it recently um, for Italian. It's like, what do I do? Like, how do I, I don't know. I don't really care about Italian, but I got to learn it. And so that's, it's an interesting thing. Like, how do you make that enjoyable, right? It's an interesting thing to look at. Find a song. So, <laughs> yeah. Find a boyfriend, find a girlfriend. That'll also work. <laughs> yeah. Not for multiple languages. Not for multiple. In the long run. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, we can wrap this up here. I appreciate okay. you for watching. What we'll I do enjoyed is, it. Um, Steve, maybe if you fire me off um, any links you want me to include in the description or whatnot, I can make sure I include those. Okay. Well, <clears throat> anything you want to plug at all? Well, I mean, obviously, we're always interested in attracting people over to Link. I have my YouTube channel, Lingo Steve. I have a, you know, a blog. So, uh, yeah, I can send you some links to those. Sure. And we can include those.
Fantastic. Go for it. I enjoyed it. Recording. Okay. Appreciate everyone for watching. Okay. Thank and you. I don't know how to stop it on Zoom. Oh, here we go. Stop. I see the button.